Amen. Okay, so we're in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. We're looking at just verses 1 through 4. And the Bible says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and, re and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. And so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So kind of give you a little bit of background on what's going on here. In the book of Nehemiah, we have a record of God moving upon the heart of an official in the land of Babylon. He was a cupbearer for the king, and he moved upon his heart to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the city walls that had been broken down and reset the gates that had been burned by fire 140 years, 140 plus years previously the city had been in that kind of condition. So if you were to finish the book, you will find that God used this cupbearer to accomplish a feat that had remained undone for 140 plus years, and he used him to do it, to do it in a period of 52 days. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So with that in mind, it's kind of a little background. We're going to begin with our first point, which is the need is revealed. The need is revealed. So Nehemiah, uh, in our text, verses 1 through 3, um, as I was in Shushan, my, my brethren came with men from Judah, and I asked them ab about the Jews who had gone back, it says escape, but had returned to Jerusalem, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said, the survivors who are left from the captivity are there, but they're in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with Fire. Now, as I was studying this passage, I began to examine the date that Nehemiah gave for when this situation that he's relating to us occurred. And when I was doing the math, I realized that the walls had been broken down and the gates burned with fire for almost 150 years, 140 plus years, as Jerusalem had been overrun by the Babylonian army. And upon conquering the kingdom of Judah, they tore down the walls and they burned the gates with fire. This took place... When I learned it, 722 B.C., I think they've changed it to 721 B.C., but you know what? I'm going with 722. So, so the prophet Jeremiah had prophesied during that time of captivity uh, that they were about to go, that the Israelites would be in captivity for 70-plus years. Decades later, during the time of the prophet Daniel, he found Jeremiah's prophesy, prophecies, and he began to pray that God would bring his word to pass concerning the repatriation of the land of Israel. Subsequently, we find that about 70 years later, just like Jeremiah prophesied, a man by the name of Zerubbabel, and I believe he was from the lineage of David, led back a significant contingent of Israelites back to the land of Israel, and they began to rebuild and they began by rebuilding the altar and reestablishing the worship of God back in the land of Israel. About 60 years after that, so 70 plus 60, here you're getting it, that Ezra, got a man by the name of Ezra, and he's got another book in the Bible, came back to Jerusalem from Babylon, and God used him to begin a program of repentance and righteous living among the people of the land who had begun to once again go back and live like the world. Now, about 12 years after Ezra arrived, Nehemiah is still in Babylon, and he asks about how things are going back in the land of Jerusalem, a place, by the way, to which he has never been. So he's a Jew or Jewish by, by his uh, uh, descendant of, of, of Jewish stock, but he, uh, genetically he's Jewish, but he's Babylonian in his citizenship. He's grown up in Babylon all his life. That's where he's lived. But his heart is for Jerusalem. His heart is for Israel. So he asks about the people that had the opportunity to go back, and he asks them what's going on back there, and that brings us to our passage and where we're at. And, but I'm telling you all this to bring out this one point that struck me when I was reading this, is that the city walls have been broken down and the gates burned with fire, and this I've said it to you twice, but I wanted to hit home almost 140 plus years. Now, all that time that the gates had been down and the walls had been down, 
why all of a sudden did Nehemiah get a burden for something that had been that way for so long? You know, if you're, if you're, uh, um, there's nobody in here like that, right? Just say with me. There's nobody in here like this. But if you were a hoarder, you've seen those shows where people are hoarders, right? And you have things all in your house, right, all up and down. You know, after a while, that becomes your normal. You don't know anything different. That's just the way you live. That's the way you've always lived. That's the way you always anticipate you will live. And the Israelites had lived generations already with the walls broken down and the gates not hung and the, the walls had been burned with fire, all that kind of stuff. They'd lived that way. So now why all of a sudden a man that doesn't even live in Jerusalem, that's never been to Jerusalem, all of a sudden why does he get a burden for something that had been that way for so long? The simple answer is that's just how God works. He moves upon the hearts of his people. Why now? Why Nehemiah? Well, I, I don't have the answer to that. God doesn't give us the answer to that. All we know is that God was moving on the heart of Nehemiah to do something that needed to be done. We don't know if God had sought to move on somebody else's heart for the, for the past 60 years. We don't know that. We do know that Nehemiah said yes. We don't know how many people said no, or if anybody else said no, all we know is that it was God moving upon Nehemiah, and it was for this time, right? And that brings us to our second point, which is the prayer of opportunity. So in Nehemiah 1.11, Nehemiah prays, and he says, Oh, Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, that's himself, and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name, and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. What man is he talking about? He goes and lets you know, uh, for I was the king's cupbearer. So he's saying, when I have an opportunity before the king whom I serve, God give me favor. Now, I'm not sure if the opportunity he prays for is for him to be able to speak to the king, for the king to do something, Right? Most of the time, if we have somebody's ear, it's not for us to do something. It's to try to get them to do something. Hardly anybody comes to me and say, would you let me do something? They always come to me and say, Pastor, would you do this? They don't quite put it that way, but that's kind of what they're saying. I have a burden for something that I want to give to you. <laughs> well, I don't want it, and I'm not going to take it, right? But... Uh, Nehemiah had a burden. I don't know if he wanted to give the burden to the king. I'm not sure. Or if he already had the idea that he wanted to do something about it. Maybe Nehemiah wasn't sure yet. Sometimes it works that way. But we do find that Nehemiah spent some time praying about it. So it may be that over the course of time, it became more clear to him how this was supposed to play out. And it reminds me of a passage in the New Testament where Jesus, upon seeing the enormity of the crowds that were before them uh, and before his disciples, said to his disciples, the harvest uh, um, that laid before him uh, uh, it was great, so would you please pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into the harvest field? In fact, that passage, Matthew 9, 35 through 38, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. Now, he didn't say, hey, I need you to go on to the harvest field. He said, pray. Why did he do that? Perhaps as they were obedient to pray for laborers, as they became more and more aware of, of, of what was the need was and what the response was, and the word of God uh, uh, began to, uh, that word began to settle down in their hearts what they were praying for, um, perhaps as they, as they sought the Lord and, and they, got, they became more acquainted with God's heart through prayer, prayer that somewhere along the way Jesus knew that if it was on the heart of the Father that that need could, uh, could be met by someone who was willing to do it. See, a lot of times if there's not a need that we're aware of, right, we're not going to respond to it. 
We know that on TV all the time. What they're trying to do is they're trying to make you aware of a need. They're trying to make you aware of need of children in South America or, or of a need in Africa or the need in Ukraine. Why? Because if there's no need, you don't respond, right? But it's also sometimes if somebody tries to make you do something, you don't always respond well as well. But if you become aware of a need and you recognize that you can do something about it, then all of a sudden you're making the decision to do something. You're making the decision to get involved. Nobody's inscripting you. Nobody's forcing you. You want to do it. It's kind of like Tanya and the kids. She found out there were kids that wanted to come to church, and, and nobody asked her. Nobody forced her. She said, can I use the van to go pick them up? Yes, here they are. Here's the key. How many kids did you pick up this morning? Six, right? And potentially we have another one coming next week, and you know, that van only holds 15 people. One of them is her. So, you know, uh, but this keeps happening. We might have to get something else somewhere down the road. That's a good problem to have. Amen? Perhaps as they were obedient to pray for laborers, as they became more aware of the word of God that they could not see because, they're, uh, because of their intimacy with God through prayer, like Nehemiah, the disciples would find themselves moving uh, to do something about the situation that God had them to pray about, and that's what happened in, in, in Nehemiah's case. Also, we find in Isaiah, Isaiah was praying about the crisis in the land at the time of the king's passing, and while we don't know the exact context of his prayers, we do know that he had a vision, and during this encounter, he heard the voice of God calling, and he heard God's query. He felt the Spirit of God pricking his heart that he was to respond to the need that was at hand. Isaiah 6, 8, 9, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom will go for me? Whom will I send? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. And God said, Go. And tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not and kept whatever the, the case may be. So anyway, that brings us to our third point. So we had the, the, uh, the first point was the need revealed. The second point was, anybody remember? Because I don't remember. <laughs> huh? The prayer of opportunity. Third point is the opportunity to act. Nehemiah 2, 1 through 6. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, uh, Nehemiah 2, 1 through 6, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine, gave it to the king. And now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore, the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you are not sick? And I want you to know that for a servant to be sad in the presence of the king, this could be a death sentence. Seriously. It's not, we're not joking about this. If you were other than what you needed to be uh, in the presence of a king, it, you you could lose your life. And so it kind of troubled him a little bit when he called him out on it. And he said, this is nothing but the sorrow of heart. And, and Nehemiah said, so I became dreadfully afraid. Not just afraid, but dreadfully afraid. Is this the end of my life? And so the, said the, and, and said to the king, may the king live forever. He said, well, I'm already there. I might as well go for it. It's about what he'd been praying for. You know, it's amazing. You pray for something, and then an opportunity comes, and then you're like, no, I'm not sure if I want to do that, right? Nehemiah is like, I prayed for something. Here's an opportunity, and I can either act or I can. It's kind of like Peter when he says to Jesus, he said, if it's really you, uh, bid me step out on the water. Jesus said, come. How many of us would go, eh, let me think about that. No, he said, I want an opportunity. Jesus gave him the opportunity, and regardless of what you think of Peter, Peter did it. Nehemiah took the risk. Sometimes you don't know if it's God until you take a risk. You've got to be willing to step out on the water. You've got to be willing to go out there on the limb to find out if it's going to hold you or not. So uh, Nehemiah says, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? And the king said to me, What do you want? What is your request? And so I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah. Now, if it was me, I'd probably say, Would you send them, or would you send them, or would you send them? If it was us and we were honest, we'd say, Tell, would you make pastor aware of this need, or, or would you do this? That's really what we do, but, but that's not what Nehemiah said. He said, Would you send me, the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. 
And the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Now, as I said before, I'm not sure if when Nehemiah started praying, this is what he had in mind. But when the opportunity presented itself, Nehemiah recognized it as being the answer to his prayer. It may not have looked like he envisioned it playing out in his mind, but somehow it had the aroma or the fingerprints of God all over it. So Nehemiah took the risk and asked for favor to do, and this is the key, what he was not qualified to do. Listen to what I'm saying. Nehemiah was not a builder. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. If you asked him about grapes, if you asked him about wine, if you asked him about how the process took place and what is required to be able to serve the king, he got that down, Pratt, no problem. But that's not what he's, what he's praying about. That's not what's happening. What's happening here is he has to go uh, from an a, a, a administrative uh, function to being a builder to being a a constructor, not just any kind. He had to go into civil construction. He had to do stuff that he was not qualified to do. Uh, (laughs) uh, Some of y'all have not heard this. I I, I say the same things over and over again, but I'm going to say it again anyway. I remember one time uh, when I was in Bolivia, and I was visiting my uncle, and we decided to go take a little trip to a village. And while I was in this village, uh, across the river was another village. And said, let's go over there. Let's visit today. So we went over there. And when I got over there, a motorcycle drives up to me. And those were the taxis of the day. And he said, Mayor wants to talk to you. I said, who? He said, the mayor. Now, this isn't a big city. It's not like Lake Jackson or anything. It's a a village. And he said, the mayor wants to talk to you. And I said, okay. Uh, I guess, you know, here... I blend in pretty well. Over there, they recognize I'm an American, I'm a gringo, whatever the case may be. So he wants to talk to you. So he pulls me into this office, and he pulls me into this office. He said, we got a problem here. And I said, well, I'm not the answer to your problem. I don't know why you got me in here. I'm thinking to myself. And, uh, and he says, uh, we've got a bunch of kids that are growing up in our village, but there's no opportunities for them. So what they do is they go to the big city, to La Paz, and they go to university there, and they get trained there, and they never come back. And if they never come back, our city's going to die, right? And that's why we got to create opportunities for our young people. we got to create opportunities for them to grow, for them to prosper, so that they have something. They don't have, I just can't wait to get out of here so I can do something significant. No, you can do something significant here. But anyway, he said, I, he said, I don't have a lot, but I have land. I can give you 500 hectares of land, which I think is 1,250 acres of land, if you will create something where we can teach our young generation a skill where they don't have to go over to the big city and do that now i'm a pastor i'm not a i'm not an educator i'm not a college professor i'm not i'm not an institute uh, i'm not a vocational guy i don't know how to create an institute i don't know how to do any of that right but here's this opportunity in front of me and at that particular time i had to deny i said no and the reason i denied it is because i couldn't see myself doing that I couldn't see myself doing something beyond what I presently did. Now, I'm not saying it was wrong for, at that time for me to deny that opportunity, but I learned something at that particular time, too. If I only do what I already know how to do, I'll never do anything beyond what I do. And I'll never trust God to do something more with my life. And I believe that I didn't have a grid or a framework for that back then, but I believe what God was trying to do is not so much create an opportunity as stretch my mentality. And so now it's not can I do it anymore, Is God is your fingerprints on this. I don't have to know how to do it. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't have to know how it's going to work out. I just have to smell the aroma of God. And if I smell the aroma of God and I feel the fingerprints of God, then all I can do is say, yes, I have no idea. I don't know how it's going to work, but I say yes, and I trust God that he's going to work it out. (laughs) Nehemiah felt the fingerprints of God, smelt the aroma of God, so he took the risk and he asked for favor to do what he was not qualified or educated or taught how to do. 
This was not what he was trained for. However, God would use him to do what he was incapable of doing if he would but take the first step towards the open door that God was providing. And God doesn't always tell you how he's going to do it. He's just wanting to see if you're willing. Right? It's not, uh, our, it's not whether you're able or not. It's whether you're available. It's not whether you can. It's whether you're willing. How often do we find God doing the same thing through the people that he calls? In 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 37, David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this giant, this Philistine. He never called him a giant. He called him an uncircumcised Philistine. Everybody else called him a giant. He said, no, he's an uncircumcised Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you're a youth. And he's a man of war from his youth. In other words, you're not a soldier. You haven't been trained as a soldier. But David said, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it, struck it, delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. In other words, I don't know how I did it. But when that happened... He's basically saying, God empowered me to do what I couldn't do. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. God equipped me to do. He'd already been anointed. The Spirit of God had come on. He's like, God equipped me to go after the lion. He equipped me to go after the bear. And in the same way that your servant killed both lion and bear, this uncircumcised Philistine would be like one of them because he hasn't defied me. He's defied the armies of the living God. And basically what he's saying is that the God who helped me to do what I couldn't do when, after, when I went after the lion and the bear will help me do the same with him. His confidence isn't in what he could do. His confidence is what God could do. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, uh, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Amos, another prophet of the Lord. Amaziah said to Amos, uh, Go, get away from here. Flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy. But don't prophesy here. That's context. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it's the king's sanctuary, and it's the royal residence. They didn't like what he was saying, so they wanted him to get out of here. Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet. I wasn't a son of a prophet. In other words, I didn't go to Bible school. I didn't, get, I didn't go to prophetic conferences. I didn't get commissioned as a prophet by somebody. I said, I wasn't any of that. I was a sheep breeder, and I was a tender of sycamore fruit. In other words, I was a farmer, and I was a... I was a rancher, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, go and prophesy to my people, Israel. God called him to do something he could not do, wasn't trained for, and that's just how God works. Matthew 4, 18 and 19, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers who happened to be both Pharisees trained in religious schools. Is that what it says? No. Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net to the sea because they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you something that you are not presently. I will make you something you're not qualified for. I will make you something that you can't even imagine. I'm going to make you into fishers of men. Matthew 9 and 9, Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, so he was an IRS agent. Didn't have a gun back then, but he probably had a sword on his side. And he said, Jesus said to him, listen, follow me. So he rose and he followed him. Matthew wasn't trained to be a, 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 um, you know, a rabbi. He wasn't trained to be a preacher. He wasn't trained. He was trained to be a tax collector. But he said, follow me. And he followed him. And he's same, same with Matthew, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Mark 5, 18 through 20, when he got into the boat, who had been, uh, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus didn't permit him, but said to him, you go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marvel. So here we have a guy that was not, uh, didn't go to synagogue. He probably didn't go to Sunday school. He probably had never been in church because he was out bound in the caves because he was screaming and he was full of demons. And then whenever he got delivered from Jesus, he wanted to go be with Jesus. And Jesus said, no, I have something else for you to do. I want you to go 
preach the gospel. I want you to go tell people what I've done for you. So, well, I mean, you can think to yourself, I've never done that before. I'm not qualified for that. I don't know any scriptures. I don't have sermon. I'm not homiletics, hermeneutics, you know, uh, all these different things that we learn. I'm none of that. And he said, you don't have to just go do what I told you to do. And he went, and, the, he, and he began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And the Bible says, all marveled. He was doing something he wasn't qualified to do. So we find that God is consistently calling people to do things which they are not qualified to do. Why does he do that? Well, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians that gives us a clue. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now, you might say to yourself, that's great that we find God does these things and that God gets the glory when we do so, but how do they do it? And we'll look at that here in a minute, but let me go back to this topic about he chose the foolish things of the world. You might say to yourself, I can't do it. I'm not qualified. I'm not the best. I'm the least. Well, that makes you qualified. I, I remember when I first went to Bama school, um, I, I struggled a lot with insecurity when I was younger. I mean, it just... It's the way it was, a very difficult family life. And um, one root lie I guess many of us struggle with is I wasn't good enough. And one of the things that I was taught in my home, uh, uh, not necessarily taught verbally, but just taught the way we lived, is that uh, if you were a, a good performer or a good athlete, then you got more favor. So the, the um, underlying value was to perform well and you get love perform well, you get honored, right? So you're, you're honored, you're loved based on your performance. We're not saying that's what they taught, but that's just the lie that we believe, so the lie that I believed when I got saved. But I don't know if you know this, when you get saved, those lies don't just go away. They're still there. How you lived your life before doesn't necessarily change when you get saved. It just has an opportunity to change you got saved, your spirit, and God, uh, the spirit of God came and lived inside of you, renewed your spirit, recreated your spirit, you're a brand new creation in Christ, but your mind needs to be transformed. You got to deal with all those things that you got in your life, those hurts, those pains, those stones that we had at the seminar, and those uh, uh, insecurities, those lies that we believe. You bring all that with you into the kingdom of God. You say, no. Nah. Why do you think Paul wrote all his letters? correcting the lies that they believed and trying to teach them the way that the things work in the kingdom of God. You've got to uh, put off the, the, the old man and, and, and get rid of that worldly way of thinking, and you've got to put on the new man, and you've got to think like Christ. You've got to present your bodies as living sacrifices. You've got to pr crucify the flesh. You've got to get rid of anger. You got, these, this is what he's talking about. I brought all that in with me. And so one of the things I remember saying to myself when I was up in Bible school, I, I was just saying, I was telling my friend, I must have, you know, I was reading the parable of the one talent, three talent, and the five talents, and I was like, yeah, I'm a five talent guy. That's why God chose me, because I'm a five talent guy. Right? Not realize I'm talking out of my insecurities. Come to find out, eh, I'm lucky to have one. I'm not demeaning myself. Paul says, I'm the chief of all sinners. The, the closer he got to God, the more the, the God, the more he realized how inadequate he was. I just have a better picture of who I am. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm uh, not valuable. It doesn't mean that I, I haven't been faithful with what the Lord has given me. It doesn't mean that God hadn't given me more, but to begin with, I was, I'm, I'm not the best there was. God didn't choose me because I was the best there was. God chose me because I was the least. I'm very conscious of the fact that I can't do this on my own. I'm very grateful that he uses me. If it wasn't for the empowerment of God and the anointing of God, I couldn't do what I do now. If you saw me 20 years ago or 10 years ago, how I preach and what I do now is not like I was back then because God's continually increasing the anointing and helped me to do what I cannot do on my own. 
I couldn't stand before people. I was shy. I didn't want to be before people. I don't want to. I, I always said to them, I don't want a big church. I just want to be on the mission field. I want to be in a little station. I want to be faithful out there. I didn't want, I don't want an notoriety. I don't want any of that. Or said, what if, that, what, what if that's what I want for you? So if the Lord gives me that, it's not because I wanted it. It's for your benefit. It's for the benefit of the kingdom. I don't want that. If you still ask me, and I'm not, I'm not here, you'll ask me. That's not what I want. But there's a need. There's a work that needs to be done. I'm not qualified to do the work. I'm not. But if he asks me to, I can say, here I am. If you want to use me to do that, Lord, I'll do that. I would prefer that he choose you. But he doesn't always do that. And if you were honest, you would prefer that he choose somebody else. Right? You just be faithful with what he's given you. Be willing to say, Lord, I don't know how to do this, and I, I, but, I, but I'm learning from Scripture. I don't have to. All I have to do is say yes. Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey. When the Spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree that the answer, Lord, is yes, Lord, yes. Now, you might say to yourself, and we'll get back to this. That's great. But um, how do we do it? How is it going to take place in my life? How is this going to happen? Well, the Bible also tells us how all these men were able to accomplish what God called them to do. In Zechariah 4, 6, and 7, uh, uh, he, he, the, the Scripture says, He answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by human might, not by power, not by human power, but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and ye shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Exodus 31, 1 through 5, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all manner of work, workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold, silver, bronze, cutting jewels for setting and carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And the reason I bring this up is for you to realize that the gift that he had to do craftsmanship came because of the Spirit of the Lord that came on his life and gave him the ability that he couldn't have on his own. Deuteronomy 34, 9, Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom for Moses had laid his hands on him. Why was he full of the spirit of wisdom? Because Moses laid his hands on him, not because he went to school, not because he had teaching and training, but because Moses laid his hands on him, and so the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded. It was a supernatural impartation of the Spirit of God. 1 Samuel 16 and 13, Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed David in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forth. How did he kill the lion? How did he kill the bear? How did he go after the uh, Goliath? How did he have the courage? How did he have the boldness to do it? It wasn't him. It was the Spirit of God that was on his life. Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power. Turn to somebody and say, I think he's talking to you because he's not talking to me. No, he's talking to you too. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do as well, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. In other words, God is doing the work in you. And he does the work through the Spirit of God that equips you and anoints you to do what you could not do on your own. I'm not, and I, want, and I just use myself as an example, I'm not up here preaching because I went to school and, and school qualified me. No, I'm up here preaching because the Spirit of God qualified me. I'm not against school. I'm not saying you can't learn something. But what, what qualifies you and what enables you is the Spirit of God on your life. 
And we can't forget that. And I'm saying whatever God is calling you to do, whatever you are not in any position any different from anybody else throughout history that's been used by God. You are in the exact same position that every one of us has been in. I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. Why would you call me? All of those things run through your mind. But it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with God who is calling you and all your opportunity is and all you have to do is say, well, Lord, I don't know how, but if you're calling me, I'll say yes. And I'll let you take care of the rest. That's always the way it's going to be. So how do we finish? When Nehemiah felt the burden for the broken down walls of Jerusalem, he started praying. When an opportunity presented itself, Nehemiah recognized it as being God's answer to his prayer. I felt like there might be a prophetic word or a tongue floating around. So just be ready for that. So it may not have looked like he envisioned it, but it had the fingerprints of God all over it. So Nehemiah took the risk, asked for favor to do what he was not really qualified to do. And by the grace of God, Nehemiah was used by God. And because of his willingness and with God's grace and anointing on his life, he did what no one else had been able to do or even wanted to do in the past 140 years. He led the people of God to rebuild the walls of the city, and he did it in 52 years. 